Well, another Monday morning is here. I've got a story here. Sometimes you see these jobs that come around and it's the only time you've ever seen it. Now, you may have seen other stuff similar to it, um, but like, for example, there was one time I drew a ticket on a 91 Explorer that wasn't that old. It was only a couple of years old at the time, and it would diesel when you shut it off. You shut it off and try to keep running, which doesn't make any sense on a fuel-injected engine. And that's the only time I ever saw that on any fuel-injected engine. I'd seen it zillions of times on carburetors. But the reason that one was doing that was because the EEC power relay was stuck closed, keeping the engine controller awake. And the engine controller, as long as it was seeing a crank sensor input, was still trying to fire the engine, or still firing the injectors, even though the ignition, which goes through the ignition switch and not a relay, had killed the ignition system. And it, whenever it was good and hot, it would go hoom ba doom 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 when you shut it off like they do. And I was thinking, this is the weirdest thing I've ever seen. But then when I saw that the injectors were still powered up, I realized what my problem was. This particular one, <clears throat> the lady said, uh, and it was actually, this was one of our college cars. It was one that only had about, I don't know, 90,000 miles on it at the time. Uh, by the time we got rid of the car at the college, it had like 350,000 miles on it. It still ran good. But uh, anyway, this particular case was... A, she heard odd noises from under the hood after she switched off the key. Uh, she said it was, she described it as a humming noise. Well, I thought that was interesting too. And so I says, okay, so is it in the front or is it in the back? That's what I wanted to know. It's always a good idea to get as much information from the person that's noticed the problem as you possibly can. I would call her my customer, but she didn't own this car. She was just one of the college administrators. And I says, was it coming from the rear? She, you know, I said, well, maybe the fuel pump's running all the time. She says, no. She said, it's not coming from the rear. It's coming from the front. But it stopped when I switched the key on and off again. So I shot the fuel pump theory in the foot, you know. So I said, well, I'll just have to see what I can see, you know, because at that time I was just talking to her. I didn't even, you know, she, the car was up in the front in one of the parking places, and I had to go get it and retrieve it because she had come back from a trip. But this rhythmic clicking was coming from the engine compartment, and it didn't even remotely resemble a hum. It was a very distinct cyclic clicking at the rate of about two cycles per second which would be two hertz, you know, click, 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 click. I mean, it was just as regular as clockwork, and it only happened when the key was turned off. When the key was turned on, you didn't have this issue. I remember this Aerostar high beam indicator on a brand spanking new vehicle. The high beam indicator was flashing on and off, just like you see in that little animation I created. And the fuse the new car guy, he didn't really have a whole lot of experience. He knew how to do pre-deliveries and simple repairs, but he didn't have a clue what to do about this. So he called me over there to give him a hand. And one time I had seen on a 99 Cherokee a high beam indicator light flashing, looked like a digital code of some kind. It was really weird. Uh, and it turned out that the, uh, the, the body computer was actually involved in that scenario because when you turn on the turn signals on something on a, one of those Grand Cherokees, um, it basically the turn signal switch sends a request to the body computer and it sends a request to the instrument cluster to turn on the high beam indicator and the body computer was actually sending some crazy signal to the instrument cluster and causing it to flash the light. Well in this case I was thinking well this thing is so regular, I'm thinking this might be um, <clears throat> some kind of a issue with some electronic box, you know, because uh, of the fact that it was as regular as it was. All right, it's kind of like the Crown Vic I was just talking about. Well, if they have a daytime running lamp module, it's responsible for turning on the high beam indicator, but this one didn't have that. And so you could just kicked that to the curb because there were no daytime running lamp module electronics to deal with. It was wired directly to the uh, high beams. Well, it turned out that this little, these little, you see these little bulb carriers here, you know, like this, and they got these contacts 
that are supposed to slide against this, these copper strips in this printed circuit. And so I put my finger on the back of this thing, I put it like right here, and I pressed on it just a little bit while it was flashing, and that stopped the flashing. And so what I did to fix that was I took and I tweaked these and made them a little tighter against that copper. You got to remember now, this was a brand new vehicle, and you see problems on brand new vehicles that you may not see on ones that have been out there a long time, oddly enough. Uh, I saw one one time that was running really lousy right off of the uh, convoy truck, and it just ran terrible. And what had happened on that was whenever they put the mineral oil in there at the factory to keep the fuel from going bad, uh, they had put too much mineral oil in the gas tank on that one, and it was running terrible because of the fact that they had put too much mineral oil in the gas tank. But anyway, what I did basically, I didn't have to replace any parts on that one. We had pulled the cluster. And I was able to put my finger on that thing and press on the back of it and make that flash and quit. And so, you know, I'm always drawing from previous experience whenever I'm looking at something like this Crown Victoria problem. Well, I could hear two of these relays clicking off and on. <clears throat> one of them was the eight power relay and one was the fuel pump relay. And those are over in front of the driver's side, you know, on a fender well. Um, and those were click, 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 click. I said, that is really weird. Um, and I say, well, let's scope this thing. You know, I was scoping for the sake of scoping just to see what I would see. I mean, this is not going to lead me to the cause of the problem, but it was fun to do. I put the breakout box on it, and I put that, uh, you know, was measuring the pins to see which ones were clicking. That's basically what I was trying to do. Well, a bunch of them were putting out funky on-off signals like that. And I say, well, this is really not doing me any good. I'm not tracking anything down because you got 104 pins on this breakout box here, you know. And uh, all you can do is confuse yourself if you try something like this. So I had gone in the wrong direction, even though I was using a scope and a breakout box and I was trying to be scientific about it, I could tell this, this was not going to get me to the answer to this problem. So I checked the battery ground cable connection to the engine block and the PCM ground on the fender near the master cylinder, but everything was just fine. Couldn't locate any loose grounds with voltage drop the blame with its own. Now you can sometimes have a ground that looks good, but it's not. You know, you take the got to take the bolt out of the nut off and scratch it around and make sure it's clean and put it back on there and tighten it up real good. I didn't see anything on this thing like that. And uh, <clears throat> but I had <clears throat> I had seen on a a uh, Ford pickup that belonged to my buddy and his wife was using, he had actually bought another truck and his wife was using this to drive down to the big long chicken houses and back and they got to where it wouldn't run and they called me over there the one you know weekend to look at it and I uh, opened it when you switch on the key there all this buzzing and clicking and it would fire the coil and just all kinds of crazy stuff and so on that particular one it so happened that this guy's dad who was a farmer had a pickup just exactly like his, except it was a different color. And I pulled the engine controller off of the bad truck that was doing all the buzzing and clicking and plugged it into the farmer's truck that wasn't given that problem. And that engine controller started doing that same stuff on that the good truck. Now, if you take a good engine controller and put it on a bad vehicle, you may destroy the bad engine, I mean, the new engine controller or the good engine controller. So it's always best to take the one that you suspect that's causing the problem and put it on a good vehicle because the engine controller is not going to hurt the good vehicle in a situation where it's just sitting still buzzing and clicking and all that kind of stuff. And that led me to replace the engine controller on that vehicle. Of course, I'd already checked the grounds and done everything else, but the engine controller was the issue on that one. Well, on this one here, I decided to go ahead and do a pull a code. It had a P1288 which is important because that means that at some point the engine had been a little bit too hot and I thought that's interesting and I remember that because it's important and that cylinder head temperature sensor is way up under here you know it's kind of you can't even really see the doggone thing but if you know where it is you can get in there to it but if you don't know where it is you'll be looking all over the place and the cylinder head temperature sensor is not the same as the engine coolant temperature sensor uh, but so a lot of some of the platforms will basically use cylinder head temperature to, you know, extrapolate the temperature of the engine and all that. Cylinder head's the hottest part of the engine anyway. So 
uh, we go peek into the data stream here, and I was going to see what the cylinder head temperature was reading, and it didn't look that bad. It was looking at 3.6 volts, you know, as well. I don't really see anything wrong here. Uh, so I'm going to sort of move away from that. You know, you got to decide not to get sidetracked. But <laughs> I should have done a key on engine off test, but I got sidetracked. And I said, I'm going to check the coolant on this thing because it was acting like it was trying to run hot. It was really low on coolant, but there were no leaks anywhere, which was extremely, you need to pressure test the thing, and it wasn't a leak anywhere, but it was low on coolant. Well, that was interesting, too. That was another clue, and it was going to lead us to the, eventually to the cause of this thing. Um, and I added about a gallon of coolant to fill the thing up. I made a mental note, I need to check the coolant level. So I keep track of the coolant level on that thing as I've maintained it, you know, in the following you know, weeks and months. So I ran it for a little while, monitored the cylinder head temperature, didn't see anything really. And I switched the key off and it was tick, 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 tick there. That tick still was. And so goofy me, I had, I happened to have an engine controller, um, well, from another Crown Victoria that we had over there that was a, an older, I mean, it had a lot more miles on it. It was a police car that had been retired from the local police force. And it had the same engine controller, so I pulled that engine controller off and plugged it in. But the clicking was still there, just like it was with the controller that was on the car. So, well, I'm glad I didn't buy one of these, because the parts store don't usually want it back after you put it on there. So, pins 71 and 97 are the ones that are powered up by the 8 power relay. And, of course, the 8 power relay powers up the injectors and everything else that the engine controller has anything to do with. And they were flashing off and on. I had kind of noticed that was part of the deal whenever I was uh, doing the breakout box thing, that those were flashing on and off. So that was another one. So I started to home in. I said, I'm going to pull fuses and see if I can make this stop. And so I started pulling fuses. But while I was over here on the other side of the engine compartment, I smelled something burning, which I had never picked up on before. Because, see, when I was pulling these fuses, I was standing out over on, out here, and I was leaning over, and I was pulling these fuses from that, from standing right there. That's when I smelled the burning smell. All right. So, this high current relay center is about eight inches behind the fuse panel where I was standing, and I had my nose right over that area when I was pulling it. So there was a little plastic cover that was covering up the starter relay and that big fan relay. And I pulled that cover and look at that relay. It was blistered and burned and hot and it had just destroyed itself. You know, it's probably that snowball factor of, you know, oxidation and heat and it keeps getting worse and the more resistance you get, the more heat you get and finally it gets where crazy things are going on. Well, this had done enough catastrophic damage to this relay that it had actually shorted the, uh, you know, the power relay powers up this too. It had taken the power that's coming into this relay and shorted it to the coil terminal inside the relay. And it was like this right here, see. Okay, and this was, see how this, these two terminals are never supposed to make contact. They got totally different power sources and all that. The PCM power relay uh, powers up the low coolant fan relay and the high coolant fan relay, which is the only one that's in a high current box. Okay, so the short was back feeding to the engine controller, right? So the engine controller was staying awake because of the PCM power relay also powers this up on pin 71 and 97, right? Well, now let's look a little closer at this and we'll analyze it. This is what it's supposed to look like. When you turn on the key, it was getting power straight through here. And it would energize that relay. And it would energize, you know, of course, the powertrain control module was getting that. And it would energize the other, you know, the uh, this is the PCM power relay. So the key, when you switch it on, would energize that. That energized the fuel pump relay. It would energize all the injectors. It would energize transmission solenoids and all that because that's the way that worked. Right. But when you switch the key off, you were getting a renegade power feed from here through that relay, and it was feeding all this same stuff. Okay, so the powertrain control module would kick on, and as soon as it was would wake up, it would try to run the fuel pump. And the fuel pump pulled just enough current uh, so that 
the fuel pump uh, would it would zero out this voltage, right? And then uh, it would go away. See, so there wasn't enough juice there to do everything that the PCM wanted to do. And so whenever the fuel pump relay killed the current, this would go dark, right? And then it would wake back up. And it would go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, basically. You know, that was my analysis of why that was happening due to that relay. It was basically, you know, when you put current on a circuit that's got some resistance, the current, the uh, voltage will go away. And any current that's there, but it's a little whisper coming through some resistance anyway. Well, the fix was, I basically, well, I got a uh, high current relay center relays and all from a salvage yard, but not before getting them off of the old police car. And I fixed the vehicle the same day, and I soldered and heat shrink the wires and put it on there so that you can, like, it was like the service master people, like, it never even happened. Um, when I put all that on there with that good, strong, brand new relay and relay center and all, uh, everything worked like it was supposed to do. The fan worked like it was supposed to do. None of the clicking was there anymore, and it completely took care of that. And there was your high current relay center I was talking about. This is another view of it from the side, and there's that fuse panel. But the thing about it is, the, what was throwing me was the clicking was over here, but the cause of it was over here, see. And I was never in this area to smell anything until I started pulling these fuses. <laughs> but I went all the way around Robin Hood's barn looking for this thing before I finally found it. Uh, it had percolated, it ran high on that 1288 code because the fan wasn't working right. And also, it, since the fan wasn't working right, when they were sitting still, no air was coming through the radiator. It had percolated about a gallon of coolant out of it, trying to overheat. It works on this Triton system that these forged have with cylinder at temperature sensors. They'll actually kill some of the cylinders to keep the engine from destroying itself. Um, anyway, well, that winds up my story this time. I hope you guys have a really great week. And I appreciate you watching. I'll see you next time. I know this was a short video, but maybe you had time to watch the whole thing. See you later.